evening. Yeah. If I could have your attention, please. So I hope you enjoyed dinner. I know I did. Had the salmon. That was great. Uh, now we'll transition to uh, Anne. Uh, she is the uh, superintendent of the wastewater treatment plant. And, uh, she has a brief statement to address you all with. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy that you're all here. We all have in common our desire, right, to uh, make a positive change for the environment. And you have all taken steps to do that. And that's why we have presented this dinner for you, because we appreciate you so much. We feel like you are our partners, because that's what we do, right? That's our, our main mission as uh, public servants is to protect the environment, to protect human health and environmental health. The city has two sewer systems, as you know, the storm drain system and the sanitary sewer system. And the storm drain system collects rainwater, and we have pump stations, catch basins, pipes, but basically all that water is conveyed straight to the river or straight to the ocean very little treatment, and so anything that you do to protect those streams directly protects the river and the ocean. The wastewater treatment, you're protecting that also. Our, our most effective wastewater treatment is done by bugs. We use bacteria in our secondary treatment to, to treat the water, to, to remove waste from the water, and if we have too many toxic substances coming into the treatment plant that can affect the health of the bugs. So our environmental compliance department here, Dave and Tanner and Fred and Ken, that's their main mission is to work with industrial dischargers to protect the safety of the, tr of the treatment plant so that the water we discharge to the ocean is clean and will not damage the ocean. Our discharge goes through a pipe that is a mile out in the Pacific Ocean. It's about 100 feet underwater. It's got 1,000 feet of diffuser ports in it. Um, that gives us a, a concept I'll introduce to you. It's called the dilution ratio. We have a dilution ratio of 139 to 1. So when we discharge our 6 million gallons of wastewater a day, it's immediately diluted to that ratio by seawater. We do an annual dye test of our discharge port. If we put dye out the end of the pipe, and we fly over it with an airplane to make sure that the ports are open and that the plume is diffusing as it should. And we inspect it with ROVs also to make sure that the pipes are clear. I can, can tell you all the other much more complicated things that we do in terms of toxicity testing respirometry tests, but we're keeping an eye on the bay, and we're keeping an eye on the river, and you guys are the ones that are helping us do that, so we appreciate it. We have, I'll tell you about a couple of fun things, new things that are coming up for us, and then if anybody has any questions, or we'll turn it back over to environmental compliance. Um, I know many of you are restaurants. We. The California State Senate passed a bill a while ago to try to divert organics from the landfill. <coughs> organics being food waste, right? So the city is approaching a pilot program to collect food waste from restaurants. The, the collection part is happening, and right now it's being processed, I think, into feedstock pellets. But that's not our final plan. Our final plan is to collect the food waste, turn it into a slurry, and then bring it to the wastewater treatment facility for digestion. The way we treat solids at the wastewater treatment facility is we collect them in, in digesters, giant tanks that we heat and we mix. The organics are digested. They give off methane gas. We collect all that gas. We burn it in our cogeneration engines and we make electricity out of it. And we make 70% of the electricity that we use 
at the treatment plant is from our quote generation facility. <laughs> so what we hope to do, now our landfill also collects methane gas and has a small engine up there that they burn, but the state knows that a lot of landfills don't. So the state is directing us to collect the organic material, bring it to the treatment plant, and increase the amount of methane gas that we create and use it to make more electricity. So that's a, a, pro a program that we're piloting right now um, in the collection system, and we hope to bring that to completion at the treatment plant. Another innovative program that we're working on, we're working very closely with uh, the Soquel Creek Water Department, Water District, they're called, they're a district, to be the source of recycled water for the Soquel Creek Groundwater Replenishment Project. Soquel Creek Water District is completely dependent on groundwater. City of Santa Cruz, you know, we have the river and we have North Coast streams. We're mostly surface water. Soquel Creek doesn't have any creeks that they take drinking water from. They are all groundwater wells, and their groundwater wells are extremely overdrafted. They've been able to determine that seawater intrusion is starting to impinge on their wells. So they are uh, moving cleverly and quickly and courageously <laughs> on a program to use our wastewater discharge to treat it to highly purified standards and to inject it in their groundwater wells to keep back seawater intrusion. The status of that program right now is that our city council, City of Santa Cruz, has approved an agreement with the district to provide the source water and to build a tertiary treatment plant at our wastewater treatment facility. We recycle water at our facility right now, about mm, 140,000 gallons a day of secondary effluent that we would normally send to the ocean. We treat it through sand filters and we use it for process water in the plant. We used to use drinking water for this. Now we use secondary effluent. But the Soquel Creek Partnership will bring in <coughs> membrane filtration units. We'll build a plant to treat about, about two million gallons a day, we'll, we will operate the tertiary treatment plant at our plant in Santa Cruz, and then we will send tertiary water to their location on Chanticleer, where they will treat it with reverse osmosis and advanced oxidation, and then they'll ship it out to um, their injection wells in Aptos. Did just hear they they have been working very hard on this project to get it grant funded by the state, and I don't think anything's announced yet. But they are looking very good to get a Prop One fifty million dollar grant for this project. So, besides the exciting lives we lead, just treating wastewater, we have <laughs> really exciting projects on the side. So. Any questions for you? Anything else you wanted to know? My table. Uh, we had some really fun discussions about uh, river sampling and uh, Cowell Beach sampling and how much we all like to swim in the ocean. We talked about the rise and fall of the San Lorenzo that you're all seeing going on. Um, yeah. So. Have any questions? I'll be here all night. <laughs> uh, next up is uh, Tanner Barnes and his presentation on uh, pharmaceutical take back. Uh, that was exciting developments. Hey everybody, I'm Tanner Barnes. I'm the newest environmental compliance inspector at the city of Santa Cruz. I'm on the east side. I think the majority of people here today are actually on the east side, so it's great to see familiar faces and great to meet some new faces too. Um, Today I'm going to be highlighting the City of Santa Cruz Pharmaceutical and Sharks Disposal Program that we started back in about 2008. And this program is aimed to basically allow people to properly dispose of their medicines, their other pharmaceutical waste, and also sharks. And so by doing this, we put in convenient drop-off locations all throughout town. 
Um, we have locations at Horse Snyder's, CVS, Walgreens. I believe the county building in town has one too. If you'd like to look at this map, um, powered by Google Maps, so you can see the exact addresses, you can look up nightproject.com and they'll work.org and they have all the information for the exact drop off loca locations. Um, and in the first year of this program, um, they are able to collect 51 million milligrams or 113 pounds of waste in the first year alone. Um, to give that some context, that is, as you can see on the screen, 28,000 doses of pain reliever, uh, 22,000 doses of anti-inflammatory, and 20,000 doses of blood thinner. And so basically, this um, made it so uh, instead of these medicines and other pharmaceuticals potentially either being dumped down in the toilet or just disposed of improperly and getting into our environment. Um, they were you know, disposed the right way. Um, and this basically means that it's staying out of our rivers, it's staying out of the public health. And so um, I believe it's made a huge uh, positive impact on our community, health standpoint and environmental standpoint. Um, and so that's been going on for just over 11 years now. And currently, we have a new program that we put in place about two weeks ago on Coral Street. Um, that's where there is a high density population of homeless people camping out there. Um, and so this was brought to us by some of the neighbor companies there um, who kind of came to us with their struggles of how it's impacting their businesses and the environment and their health. Um, so firstly, we were able to put a shark's kiosk, and that's right there on um, coral and lime kiln. Um, that's right into the granite rocks wall right there in salt, and so that's giving people access to dispose of needles properly. And we do know that not every needle is going to be able to make it in there, unfortunately, but at least it does give people an easy access point to put in the needles, and that is being serviced right now on a um, twice a month, and that will either that will change depending on if we need to be serviced more or less. We're hoping more, hoping to get more needles in there. Um, and secondly, we uh, on Coral Street there, um, a, pri a private, a jointly private and public effort to clean up Coral Street was um, an idea that we got of power washing there on the street. Um, and that was an effort with PD and our streets team, where PD went in first and kind of got the campers, notified them in time, gave them time to be able to move any of their belongings that they'd like to move. And then after that, we had, they were able to move. And after that, we had the streets team going in and just cleaning up any other trash debris that was left behind. And then lastly, that allowed a contractor to go in, block the storm drains, power wash the whole sidewalk and gutters, be able to contain the water, and then send it down to the sanitary sewer where we, where we can then treat the water, rather than waiting for a rain event to happen and for all that water to then, and anything that was left on the sidewalks of the gutter to then be left, going to the San Lorenzo, which is um, right nearby, and then eventually into our ocean. Um, and so we did that on both sides of the street, and we're hoping that with the success that we're seeing this program take place on Coral Street that it could potentially lead to more places in the city that need this. And then I have a visual here for you all where we've given this to some businesses, but this is a smaller needle kiosk that can be mounted to the wall or elsewhere where they can properly dispose of needles. And we do have a few of these, so if you need to, we could always provide this for your business. And that is our current update. I was wondering if anyone has any questions or comments on this, because this probably affects a lot of businesses in town. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Or I'll be here all night. Yes, stay there. Sure. Yep. Hey, um, we have a business on North France 40 near Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And you know, we get random sharps in our parking lot, amongst other things, but when we do it, what do I do with them? Yeah, um, so that could be where we can either provide one of these sharps containers or another smaller container if, you, right. if you'd rather have something for the meantime. Okay. And we'd say for that, you know, definitely protect yourself. You know, I just don't want to get the shovel and put it in the 
dollars. Yeah, yeah, because then you're disposing who yeah. totally knows where it will go. Uh, but what we'd ask is if we do have one of these containers that you would then use maybe some sort of prongs to be able to pick it up and put it into the container, just okay. or at least gloves, you know. I wouldn't say that use your bare hands, because you never know. Thank you. What would you say the success is at this point of, the, of people actually using those containers, especially like the one down on Coral Street? Yeah, for that, um, I could tell you, I could give you an update in maybe about a week or so, because we just got it in and we don't, we haven't had it serviced yet. So, um, you know, and the success can be measured in a few different ways, but if we just get a few needles on, for we, I think that is leading to success at least. Okay. If I may just add a little bit, I think we can illustrate the success of that from the places before Coral Street. So Coral's not the first. And we've had uh, a contractor that Tan is working with who collects and sends us data on a monthly basis. And if anybody wants that, we will ask Jen to put it on the website. Jen is our this principal information officer and she would put it on the website and you can see it. It's very successful. And the city I think announced that they're voting money to put four more around the city. But it is very successful. There's data for easily five years now from different areas where the contractor because he has to bill for it and we have to pay him. So we know by weight how much he collects at each site that he goes to. Yes. You know, these uh, smaller individual mm -hmm. business containers, who bears the responsibility of collecting and emptying? Does somebody come and pick them up? Yeah, so for that, I could be contacting your environmental compliance inspector on when that is starting to get to the maximum fill line, so then we can um, go through our third party contract for that picks up you know, these bins all throughout town because we have people, let's see, coming to these convenient locations, they have drivers in town almost every day. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you so much for being here. Um, if you do have any more questions, I will be sitting right there and yeah, and we can talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. TMDL. So, what is a TMDL? Well, TMDL stands for the total maximum daily load, and this has applications to surface water bodies in, uh, in our case, in uh, city limit. So, let's go on here. So, uh, TMDL, of course, uh, applies to pollutants and how we want to control them. So yes, what is a TMDL, total maximum daily load? The TMDL establishes the maximum amount of a pollutant allowed in a water body and serves as the starting point or planning tool for restoring water quality. And so who establishes a TMDL? Well, this comes down from the Clean Water Act, the feds. And in our case, uh, we have uh, this authority has been delegated to our state uh, through the uh, Water Board and uh, it's further uh, divided into regional water quality uh, control boards. And it comes in the form of a basin plan. Uh, it gets kind of complicated, but uh, the basin plan really uh, establishes our goals for the water bodies. And so uh, our monitoring uh, comes on the basis of the requirements. So who does the work in the city? So of course this is uh, the environmental compliance inspectors. We grab the samples and then the laboratory at the wastewater treatment plant, they analyze the samples and give us the data. All nice friendly folks to work with. And, uh, if you see them around town, say hi. Okay, so what are our goals? So we need to work within a regional framework because uh, the city exists with the county and uh, we share the same water bodies and uh, the same pollutant sources. Um, data collection, well we've been going on since uh, 2010 about and uh, we're 
developing information on the trends of bacterial levels to monitor the effectiveness, the effectiveness of our BMPs. BMPs are uh, the city's best management practices. So that is uh, how we control pollutants, what practices we put in place to control these pollutants that are surface water bodies, such as San Lorenzo River, uh, Carbonara Creek, and Brent's Creek. Those are the main ones here. Yeah, and of course we want to establish what pollutant sources. If we do find that a water body is polluted, what's the source? Is it uh, from birds? Is it from uh, campers? Is it from septic systems or RVs? There's all kinds of sources. So we have to do source tracking as well. So just a history here on our sampling. We started in uh, 2010 just looking at bacteria in uh, San Lorenzo River, Grants Party Creek, and Carbonara Creek. And started off uh, relatively light sampling, just uh, 13 weeks a year. Then we have uh, ramped it up since then, looking at uh, bacteria and also TSS, that is the total suspended solids. That's sort of the amount of dirt that's suspended in the water body. And then looking at nutrients, that is uh, at, uh, phosphates, uh, nitrates. Uh, yeah, that might. Uh, be the food sources for bacteria. So, want to uh, keep tabs on all these these things. <coughs> and recently, we have expanded it quite a bit with uh, looking at bacteria, uh, turbidity, as well as TSS. So that's kind of how much light will pass through the sample. Uh, PCR that is uh, polymerase chain reaction that uh, tells us what kind of DNA. Uh, what life form has uh, deposited the bacteria. So uh, we're interested, of course, in uh, human sources because those are controllable. If they're animal sources, well, we, there's not a lot we can do. But uh, caffeine, again, that points to a human source. Fecal sterols that, will, that can be correlated with either human or uh, animal sources. So we've, we've expanded the program and looking at uh, all different kinds of analytes to get a better picture of uh, where our pollutants are coming from. Here's a map to uh, give you an idea of what sample sites we have. So we've prioritized the sites at city limit. That's kind of our starting point. Uh, if the water is already impaired at city limit, there's not a whole lot more we can do. So that's where we have to uh, work with the county to establish uh, what the county can do if we're already impaired at that point. But then as we do our sampling, as we come into the city, we can see are we getting better or worse as we come into the city. We have uh, four sites on San Lorenzo. One is here, this is at Tate Street, it's pretty much by the uh, city courtyard, by the uh, uh, Santa Cruz Metro complex. The next sampling site here is at the, by the Ross Pedestrian Bridge. The next site on San Lorenzo, this is the uh, Pedestrian Bridge at uh, San Lorenzo Park. And our final site on San Lorenzo is at the Train Trestle. Uh, now I'm going to, uh, I guess, Carbonara Creek. We have just one exclusively on Carbonara Creek, and that's at City Limit. That's right where uh, it's at Carbonara Drive, it's not far away. Prince 43, we go as high as uh, it's the Santa Vita. Santa Vita is a motor, uh, it's a motor home camping uh, area at city limit. And then uh, the next site is at the uh, confluence, basically, between Carbonara Creek and Prince 43, right where Avalon meets Market Street. And the next site down, this is Water Street and Market Street at Prince Valley Creek. Final site on Prince Valley Creek is at, again, about the uh, San Lorenzo Park area. So we've tried to sample the whole city and establish where our sources are and where things could be improved, where, uh, where things are happening. So we've tried to cover the whole city for those water bodies.
So, like we touched on before, what do we test for? Where we're looking at the total system in solids and turbidity, those are related. Nitrate and bacteria. Nitrate is sort of an aged, uh, aged uh, analyte uh, that can point at uh, human waste or uh, septic systems. Uh, bacteria as well, uh, recent human waste or animal sources. PCR, like I said, uh, polymer polymerase chain reaction, that's DNA for uh, source tracking. Caffeine points towards human sources. Uh, fecal sterols, again, human or animal origin. And so why do we do it? Well, there's a TMDL. So we have this total maximum daily load for sediments, for nitrates, and pathogens. And then, of course, we're source tracking. If we do see some things that are dirty, where's it going to all right, now, I really love data, so this is a plot that I made up. Uh, it's a lot to look at, so I'm not going to uh, belabor it too much. But um, what we have here is uh, our years. So this is all the years that we've been studying and doing an analysis. So this is just looking at the San Lorenzo River. So what we see at city limit here is, so. This is the SLR1, this is at city limit. This is SLR2, this is at the Ross uh, pedestrian bridge. SLR3, this is at the uh, San Lorenzo pedestrian bridge. And then SLR4, this is at the train truck. So basically, just looking at the block, this block, this is this block, and this block, and this block, we see things are lower and then they get bigger. So what this is, this, this is, um, the percentage of measurements of bacteria in exceedance of the TMDL limit. So we're getting higher and higher as we're going through the city. So we're seeing uh, more bacteria as we are going through the city, but we've already started off at a, a pretty bad place. So with, in combination with the nutrients that are already in the water, some people would argue that, well, We'd expect the bacteria to increase if we have a seed, if it's already seeded, if we have the food to feed it. So, uh, yeah, the picture is we're, we're not improving as we're going through the city, but there's not a lot we can do about that, perhaps, because we've started off with some pollutants. Now, if we look at the colors, we can see that uh, it's kind of hard to tell how things have changed throughout the year. But perhaps, most recently, things are not the best they've been in the past five years. So I won't say much more than that about this data. I'm not everyone's a data person, but uh, I'd love to talk all about it. So if you have more questions later, I can, I can talk. So what can we do? So the city has BMPs, best management practices. So one of those is to control homeless encampments, which might be uh, you know, the homeless donors that we have a sewer system. To you. So uh, the city can uh, break up camps and uh, control sources of pollution that way. Uh, again, the city has uh, some BMPs to control pet pollution as well. These are examples of uh, doggy bags or uh, doggy pet waste bags uh, that the city will use. And, uh, also, you might be familiar with poop fairy signs. I love these signs. I remember when they appeared. West Cliff, that was a, was a pretty good OK. Um, so uh, I should say, too, that uh, this presentation uh, was put together by uh, several groups. Also, uh, Storm of the Water contributed to these slides. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks for that. Uh, these are from that group. So yeah, the, the city has uh, uh, three different ways it uh, tackles uh, bacteria EMPs as far as the TMDL goes. So the first is this, um, we control sewer spills. And so uh, uh, the property owner is responsible to uh, clean up sewer waste spills. Sorry to show this photo, but uh, yeah, this is a, a sewer spill. Uh, and so um, the city re re requires cleanup and then uh, reinspection and uh, correction of uh, torn up and broken up uh, sewer levels. Um, and 
have to pass inspections every 10 years. So these are new rules that just came into effect. And also, uh, when properties are sold, uh, they are required to be inspected. The sewer laterals are required to be inspected to make sure they're uh, not going to have these uh, sewer spills. And yeah, just so you know, uh, I guess this would be a little uh, bit of info, but the homeowner, the property owner, is responsible for their sewer lateral all the way out into the street where it meets the city main. So uh, a lot of people think that because the blockage has been found out in the sidewalk or street area, that maybe the uh, city is responsible. But no, uh, in this uh, city, the homeowner is responsible for the entire sewer lateral. Okay, and then uh, TMDLs to um, combat sediment pollution. These, uh, oftentimes you've seen, hopefully not, uh, though, a uh, dirty construction site. I see them a lot because uh, mm -hmm. I'm an inspector, but uh, yeah, we want uh, BMPs. So these are um, straw waddles, uh, things to control sediment runoff from construction sites. Say when it rains, we don't want all that dirt to wash right off into the storm drain. So the city reviews building permit plans and uh, for erosion control. And uh, also, yeah, the city has a street sweeping program to control the <coughs> sediment that's already in the road, from getting down into the catch basins and into the water bodies. And they expand the existing program where uh, there might be no parking on certain streets so that the city street sweeper can get those areas. I know that uh, down south they've had programs like that for quite a while. And of course, uh, the stormwater program will report uh, to the state, uh, to the public. So that's about it for that presentation. Uh, I covered a lot and probably pretty quick, but uh, it is actually. This presentation was engineered for uh, a city audience, but I uh, figured you know, a few folks could handle it. <laughs> okay, uh, any questions? If I can just ask uh, before the questions, if Eric would join you there, because there are questions on BMPs, which I think is at least I want to know, so you can both stand there and try to explain. Eric is from the Stormwater Program, managed by Suzanne. And Part of the presentation, you heard how the monitoring became more sophisticated as we couldn't figure out where the bacteria were coming from, including the analysis that they've described as PCR, which is looking at the DNA associated with the bacteria to see whether they were from humans we, we could control or others. That was paid for the instrumentation and the training for that sort of sophisticated work was paid for by Suzanne and Eric's program. It didn't come from our program. And with another sophisticated part of it is fecal sterols, which Dave also mentioned. Those are oils that come from animals, any animal with backbones, including humans. But their ratios tell us when we find them whose bacteria it is. And those tests were paid for by that group. I figure it's important to have them speak if you have questions on those things. Questions? I know just from our annual reporting that the city has done over 300 um, inspections of private sewer laterals. Um, so that's just a, a stat I have off the top of my head. <laughs> And there's probably been a lot of repairs associated with those 300 inspections, but that's just kind of a new stat we have from this first year of um, the order ordinance. Right. Sorry, I didn't want to blow your mind with all that data, but uh, there's quite a lot after dinner. All right, what's next on our program? Again, one in front of you. So there are no questions? Does this mean that this was so murky that nobody had to leave it? It's, it's clear as mark. Thank you. Before I go on to the 
truly uh, important part of recognizing the um, you guys who are the reasons we're here. I'd like to recognize the people who do the work. And if you don't mind, I'm going to start with Fred Baker, who's our uh, longest serving environmental compliance inspector. He is a specialist in many of the things you've just heard, as well as the landfill. We didn't talk about the landfill today, but he's been monitoring for the methane and other gases over there. Um, so he is from the environmental compliance group. And uh, Tanner, who you've heard from tonight, is our newest member of the team. And I'm particularly proud that we got him. And as you can see, he's doing tremendous work. And Dave Martin, who you just heard from, whose wife also works in the laboratory, so I, I suspect he takes some of this work home. But there it is. <laughs> uh, so those are the people who do all the, the, the gathering and um, all that to inform the work that we do. And without further ado, I'm going to ask our systems manager, Ann Logan, who is going to uh, uh, award the plaques for tonight. And I think Fred was going to do the announcing of the system of these plaques. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, this is the fun part of the evening. Um, the rest of here. Del Pueblo Market, 
Auto World, and Lupolo Craft Beer House. Well, I think that concludes our program. Do you have anything to add, Akin? No, thank you. Okay, all right. Well, we do this every year because we appreciate you all so much. And we're here to chat, or we'll see you again next year. Thank you for coming.